Okay, we're good to go. Okay, we're live now, so we can. Okay, just... okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to day two of uh, mastering the graduate school application process, and uh, I hope you all learned a lot in the in the day one. So, the one uh, program aired yesterday it was truly, truly, truly educative. So um, today we're looking at uh, four major things. We're looking at um, in the GRE. You know, yesterday we did the uh, in the GRE, but we did only the quantitative section. Today we look at in the GRE for the verbal section and then the two fan. And also we're looking at writing a winning statement of paper. We're looking at Academic CV, to, uh, the resume and the uh, recommendation letters. I'm also looking at ACN graduate school interviews. So uh, we have uh, four major speakers that will uh, be partnering with us on this session. So please, I, I will advise, advise us to, if we don't have data, we should just subscribe and then ensure that we don't need this program. So yes, our first, topic for today, it's in the two fair. So um, we have uh, Emmanuel Rando, which is a, who is a first class graduate of civil and environmental engineering from the University of Lagos. And then he's, a, he's, he's passionate about advancing Africa development via research and innovation, particularly in the, in the resilient infrastructure and sustainable communities. Consequently, he will be starting his PhD in social engineering at United States of America in fall 2023. So it will be the one that will start uh, the first session. So thank you, uh, Emmanuel Rando, for being with us on this meeting. We look forward to, to learning from you. Thank you very much. Hello, okay. So, hello, everybody. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Imano Randu. And um, as uh, Ogene Uchuku has introduced me, I am going to be talking a little bit about um, GRE, especially the verbal aspect. And I will just give you a run through about analytical writing, which is AWA. Then I'll move and then round up with. Before I even start talking about these examinations, I know since yesterday, you know, you people have been seeing a lot of information. And, uh, you know, it might feel a little bit daunting that, ah, can I really do this? Uh, and I want to tell you that it is very possible for you to do it. And, and the reason why I believe it is possible for you to do it is because I have done it as well. I have been uh, at the stage where you guys are as a final under, uh, final year students in my undergraduate studies at the University of Lagos. And I wanted to pursue graduate study. And, uh, you know, knowing through the various processes, it seemed like it was a lot of things to do. But eventually, here yeah, I am today. And um, thankfully, I've been able to go through those processes. So it is very, very possible for you to be able to achieve this. Uh, I, have, I have been there and I have done this and I believe you two can do that as well. Um, below is an attachment of uh, my score in my verbal GRE as well as my analytical writing. So essentially it's just a way of me telling you to, uh, to be motivated and not beat yourself out of the race before even starting the journey. Okay, so uh, the Jerry verbal. The Jerry verbal is just a way of trying to test uh, your your ability to to read and write. Just uh, plain, plain and simple. But it is a little bit more than that. It is trying to see how well you understand st uh, sentence structures and understand how words should uh, uh, should connotate in a sentence. So now uh, today I'm just going to give you a little bit of a run through of what Jerry Verbal is about. So and I will give some sample questions to just give you an insight into what you'll be seeing while you are preparing for your Jerry Verbal. So now the structure of the Jerry. Uh, 
yesterday we started GGRE, but we focused more on quantitative. So today I'm going to be looking more about uh, your verbal reasoning aspect and your AWA. Now the verbal reasoning aspect of the GRE is two sections guaranteed. We are going to be having 20 questions in two sections, 30 minutes. Now it is possible that a third section might come up due to the experimental uh, methods in which uh, the GRE uses, but generally let's just stick to the two that is sure for right now. And then the scoring scale for the GRE is between 130 points to 170 points, with 130 points being the lowest score possible and 170 points being the highest score possible. And then you're increasing at one point uh, incremental value. Now for the AWA, which is the analytical writing, you have is a score between zero to six, with your zero being the lowest and your six being the highest. So you can get uh, a 0 0.5, a 1, a 1 1.5, and like that, a 0 0.5 uh, incremental values for your analytical writing. Now, this is what I was just talking about in relation to the six sections. Now, definitely you're going to be having the analytical writing section. You're going to get two quantitative sections and two verbal sections. Now, there will not be one more section which is possibly a uh, verbal or quantitative section. That is determined by uh, the Jerry body. Now, the Jerry verbal, let's now go and narrow down into our focus for today. Now, the Jerry verbal has three sections. We have the reading comprehension, uh, comprehension section, and that is essentially tasking you on to read passages and answer questions about the main idea, your tone, your purpose, and specific details of the passage. Then the second one is the text completion section. Now, this text completion section is just going to give you a sentence and it's going to feel, give you one or three blanks for you to be able to fill in those words with the best words you believe will make the sentence uh, comprehensible. Then finally, we have the last one, which is the sentence equivalence section. Now, this one, they're asking you to choose two words that can best replace another word in a sentence. So it's essentially uh, testing your ability to use synonyms. Are we together so far? Yes, we are with you. And if you want to respond to your mother, you can just use the chat box. Okay. Okay, so like I mentioned, there are three sections here. Yeah? So we have the reading comprehension section, we have the test completion section, and we have the sentence equivalence section. So I'm just going to give you uh, a short uh, example of how the reading comprehension section can look like. Now, of course, there are short passages, there are medium passages, and there are longer passages in the GRE section. But this is just an example of a short passage that will just give you a little bit of an introduction into what uh a reading comprehension can look like in the jerry now it's it, this section is just talking about popular music in classical composition now the comprehension can be on varied topics it can be on music it can be on science it can be on law it can be on uh, different aspects of uh, human lives and that's why it is very important for you when you are preparing for your GRE to try and read uh word read uh, the economists read books about uh, about science about art especially if you are an engineering student try to read a little bit about art if you are an art student try to read a little bit about science so that when you are looking, when you are coming to the Jerry uh, test center and you are seeing a topic about maybe astrophysics, you are not wondering, that, hey, what is this? I have no idea what this is. And then before you even start reading the passage, you are already feeling defeated, and that will affect your score in the long run. So this is just an, an example of a passage. And then I'm just going to look at a section of the question. Now, they said the passage addresses which are the following issues raised by Glass, Glass in use of popular elements in his classical composition. Now, if we go through the passage very well, just say, okay, reviving the practice of using elements of popular music in classical composition. And our approach has been in a nation of the United States during the 1960s. Now, the name Glass comes up. Now, Glass was born in 1937, and he embraced, he embraced the ethos of popular music in his composition. So essentially, this passage is telling us that there is a man, Glass, he's a composer from what we can see, and he also embraced the ethics of popular music in his composition. Now, Glass has based two symphonies of music by rock musicians, David Bowie and what Bran Eno. But the symphony sounds are distinctive to it. So yes, he copied some styles from two musicians, but those 
styles are, he still puts his own uniqueness into those styles. Now, you say popular elements do not disappear out of place in glasses, classical music, which from his early days has shared sensing harmonies and rhythms in rock music. Yet, this use of popular elements has not made class a composer of popular music. His music is not a version of popular music packaged to attract classical listeners. It is the I art for listeners steeped in rock rather than classics. So this is the passage. I hope you guys have been able to read it because I'm just going to try to make you people attempt one or two questions in this next uh, slide to be able to see if you have any understanding of how to read a uh, comprehension passage or to give you an insight to what it is like in uh, uh, reading a GRE passage. So this is the first question. And this is the one I'm going to be using as a sample for uh, you guys. So please, you can just indicate in the chat box what you think the answer of this question should be. We have only two minutes for that because uh, we are trying to keep to time as well. It's two minutes, not even a long time when you're on the GRE hot seat. <laughs> it is, but I, I, I'm believing these guys are, you know, this is their first time encountering something like this, <laughs> generally. <laughs> so uh, just giving them an average. All right. Am I getting any responses in the chat? Uh, not yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, should I go back to the passage for you guys to see or you're okay with just this question? You guys should say something in the chat box so that we can uh, proceed. So we have a lot to cover. I think we have something in the chat box. Okay, they want you to go back to the passage. Okay. So we have just 30 seconds left to answer the question. Okay, 30 seconds is over. Or, uh, Emmanuel, we have answers in the chat box if you want to proceed. Okay, so they are just, I'm just going to show you the answer of that one. And the answer was E. Okay, so these are just examples of questions you can see in the reading cooperation passage. I hope someone got the answer, but if you did not get the answer, it's very fine because <laughs> I can tell you how many answers I got wrong when I first started preparing for my GRE as well. So it's it's just an insight to see how um, the questions can be like and how the options can be as well. So this is another question, and uh, this one was just telling you to pick more than one answer. When you see a an over box in your GRE for the verbal, they're expecting you to choose one answer. But when you see a square, there, there is the connotation that the answer could possibly be more than one. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. And the next one is the text completion stage. Now, the text completion, like I explained earlier, is um, going to give you a full sentence, but it's going to remove some words and um, replace them with blanks. Now, your task for this section is essentially to choose the words you believe will uh, make the sentence still uh, viable in the original context of which the sentence was created. So it is trying to see how well you can decipher the meaning of a sentence by just reading through um, the clues, using the commas and uh, contrasts in, in a sentence. So now this one is telling you to, um, it is refreshing to read a book about our planet by an author who does not allow facts to be dashed by politics. Now this, without even looking at the options, you will know that what they are trying to tell you here is, essentially this author is not trying to be influenced by politics. Now, he's saying well aware of the political disputes about the effects of human activities on climate and biodiversity. Now, the author wrote about climate change and biodiversity. And obviously, there is a lot of political uh, disputes about what climate change is, the effect of climate change on the world, and on every other thing that comes into play. But now, this is another clue for the first option again. He said the author does not permit them to. 
So he's essentially trying to um, prevent the issue of political discussions, political disputes to influence his opinion or his facts about uh, climate change. Now, his comprehensive description of what we know about biodiversity and biosphere, he emphasizes that the enormous gaps in our knowledge, the sparseness of our observation and the dash. Now, he's essentially saying that we do not know much about this climate change. So if we are saying we are giving different disputes, we are talking about climate change without actually having knowledge. So we are making various assumptions that cannot be attributed to facts. So the third option too should talk about you not knowing much. Now, if we now go to the options that are possible. Now, blank one, we said is trying not to be overshadowed by politics, which is option A. Because essentially we have agreed that the author is trying not to be uh to be influenced by political discussions. Then if we go to the second place, we are saying it doesn't allow, it's not permitting them to what? It's not permitting them to obscure his vision. It's not trying to allow the political discussions to influence his opinion or influence his outlook of the facts that are actually available about climate change. Then the last one, which is the third option, is now talking about, okay, we do not know much about climate change. So if we are saying possibility of hypothesis, it's not telling us that, okay, there are many guesses or we are not sure. It's, It's telling us essentially that, oh, we do not know much about climate change. We are just making assumptions. We are just making guesses. And that's why it should be superficiality of our theories. Okay, so that is that about sex completion. And uh, now we are going to the last section of the GRE verbal. Now, if I'm too fast, please tell me, because I'm just trying to um, give you a rundown of uh, the various sections in your GRE verbal, as well as giving you some samples of the types of questions you can possibly see in your GRE verbal. So the last one or the last section of your GRE verbal is the sentence equivalence. Now, what this is is aiming for is for you to find uh, two words that are synonyms and fit into the sentence here. Now, like the instruction says in this question, it says, choose two answer choices that when used to complete the sentence will fit the meaning of the sentence as a whole and produce completed sentences that are like in meaning. So you are trying to do two things essentially with the answers you are choosing. You are trying to choose answers that will fit into the sentence and will also make, uh, uh, will also be replaceable with themselves when they are used. For example, in this question now, it's saying, although it does not contain some pioneering ideas. Now, pioneering ideas means groundbreaking, fresh ideas. One would hardly characterize the work as now, let's read again. It said, although it does contain some pioneering ideas. Now, yes, we agree that some groundbreaking ideas are in this work, but you cannot actually characterize that work as what original or innovative, because most likely the work also contains some things that are not fresh ideas. So that's what you're trying to tackle as well in your uh, GRE uh, verbal in the sentence equivalence section. So this is just an example. There are more uh, examples that you can as well tackle on your own and improve your ability to answer questions of this type. Now, I have some general tips for you to uh, improve yourself in your GRE verbal and uh, get as much as possible this course you want. Some people might be aiming for 170 over 170 yeah, and I believe it is very possible because people have done it and uh, I believe you can do it as well. So to, um, to improve yourself, to improve your abilities to ace the GRE verbal, I encourage you to read articles from different, uh, different journal outputs, different uh, news publications such as the New York Times, your Scientific American, your Economist, and so on and so forth, to be able to develop your understanding of contrast in sentences, in passages, especially in your reading comprehension section, and to also give you an ability to understand, uh, um, you know, different different topics and different insights from different writers. Then as well, to develop your strong vocabulary, because for your sentence equivalence section, you need to be able to understand uh, the meaning of words for you to be able to say, okay, these words are synonyms and should be able to fit into the sentence as well. So you can use resources such as your Magosh, your Kaplan, you know, your flashcards as well, and ma- various other sources as well. 
now also for time management like Faida said in this call when i was giving you people two minutes to answer just one question in you know, your reading compression she was like oh you will not have that much time and that is the truth because you're trying to answer uh, 20 questions and you do not have enough time and your reading compression passages as well you're trying to answer a lot of questions and trying to think about them as well so as you're practicing try to manage your time put a stopwatch beside you and um, try your best as much as possible to to, to be as fast as possible while trying to be accurate as well. Now, the second section I said I was going to be talking about, now I'm going to be glossing over is just essentially to test your ability to write in English language. And this section is divided into two. You are going to be tested on an ability to write on an issue task and on an argument argumentative task now the issue task is it's just going to ask you to give your opinion about a certain topic it can be something as simple as education okay why do you think um, children should go to college give your opinion that is just what an issue task is all about then argument task is that they are going to give you um, someone's argue a storyline essentially and the person will give you a reason why he believes that this storyline is plausible, either supporting it or, or, you know, going against it. And then your job now is to analyze the arguments of that person and to give your opinion or your position on why that, uh, that argument is not logically sound. So you are going to be looking for loopholes really uh, brought about in the analytical writing section of the GRE. Now, this is an example of an issue task. Like I said, it's just a simple uh, sentence where they are going to be sorting to ask for your opinion. Do you agree with this? Do you disagree with this? Okay, tell us why you agree with this and tell us why you disagree with this. Now, this place is just saying, okay, as people rely more and more on technology to solve problems, the ability of humans to think for themselves will surely deteriorate. So it's asking you, do you think technology gives people more, uh, they have more ability to think for themselves in solving questions, or does it make humans lazy in their ability to solve questions as well? So that's what this issue task is asking us. And this is just uh, a sample of, a, a general sample of a six over six call in uh, your issue task. So this, this is just giving you the breakdown giving you a sample of which you can use to develop your own templates and answer for yourself now we have your argument task now like i said your argument task is going to give you a scenario it's going to paint a scenario and then the writer is going to give you reasons why he believes this scenario is this it's going to give you an argument now in response to this you are now meant to find the loopholes in these arguments, like what are, and, and what are the loopholes in his considerations, and what are the loopholes in his uh, non considerations, and why do you think those are pivotal in the conclusion of the argument? So, this is just an example as well of uh, an argument tax. Now, I would advise you in preparation for your issue tax and your argument tax to learn how to type quickly and currently with a laptop keyboard now, because most times that is what you're going to be using in uh, in taking these exams now that is my first general tip learn how to type fast on the computer keyboard it is very essential because it is possible for you to have five points 20 points 100 points in fact and if you are not able to even put down one point in your jerry uh, awa that is what they are going to be using to score you. So first of all, if you are knowing you're going to be uh, writing your GRE anytime soon, try as much as possible to learn how to type as fast as possible on your keyboard accurately as well, because you don't want to be typing five, 10 sentences. And when you look at the sentences, you are trying to, you have to go back to correct almost 50 to 60 mistakes. You are at the end of the day losing efficiency and losing the time you should be using to gain more points and finishing your essay as best as you can. Now, me, generally, I would encourage people to use Greg Maths for preparation of ADWA. Now, I'm not saying that is the only material. I'm not saying that is the best material. But I believe uh, it's helped me a lot. So I encourage people and I recommend it most times for people to use in preparation of the analytical writing because it generally gives you tips on how to structure your essay and how to deliver the best 
uh, essay you can with your time. So that was all about the GRE verbal and the AWA. Uh, I can't see the chat, but I believe that if you have questions, you can drop them into the chat and uh, we have uh, fired that there to help us answer the questions as accurately as possible. And at the end of um, my section as well, I'll open the floor to questions from people and I'll try to answer a couple of them myself. Okay, so now the last, uh, aspect for my presentation today is about acing the TOEFL section. Now, TOEFL is it's it's very similar to your GRE verbal in the sense that they are also trying to test your ability to um to to your ability or your understanding of the English language. But now the TOEFL is more centered on English. It is not testing anything other than your English, unlike the GRE that is okay, we'll test your quantitative, it will test other things and all that. But GRE, um, the TOEFL also introduces your speaking aspects. It also wants to see your ability to speak. It's not only testing your ability to identify sentences, but it's, it's also identifies or tries to rate your ability to also speak and communicate in the English language as well. Once again, I am encouraging you that the TOEFL is simple. I did the TOEFL myself and um, I was able to get a reasonable score of 113 over 120. So I have been there, I have done it, and I believe you can do it as well. So let's go straight into the TOEFL section. Now, the TOEFL section exam generally takes from 182 to 216 minutes, which is roughly about three hours um, or, or more. But it is essentially now broken down into different sections. Now we have the reading section, we have the listening section, we have the speaking section and the writing section in your TOEFL exam. Now, the reading section, the reason why I wrote 50, 54 to 72 minutes here is it depends. For someone, you can see 30 questions in your own. The next person will see 40 questions. The other person will see 28 questions in his listening. Another person will see 39 questions in his listening. But generally, it, it balances out in the sense that if you have many reading questions, you most likely will not have so much listening questions. But if you have so many listening questions, you might not have as much reading sections as the other person as well. So they generally try to even it out and uh, test you holistically on how you can read, how you, you can listen to um, uh, the English language, how you can speak the language, and finally, how you can write the English language. So this is the breakdown of how the exam is generally in uh for the TOEFL IBT section now for the reading section you're generally like I said depending on what they are going to be giving you you're going to have three or four reading passages and in those passages you are meant to answer at least 10 questions now for me I believe the TOEFL was very much or uh, easier than uh, the reading passage in your uh in your GRE book and the reason is because the TOEFL is a little bit more straightforward in asking you questions in your um in your in your reading comprehension passage. Although now it's getting a little bit tougher than um before, but it is not still comparable to your GRE verbal reading comprehension section. Now the to the the reason I said that is because for your TOEFL, <clears throat> it gives you the it actually takes you to the aspect of the of the video comprehension, it is asking you question one. So if you have question one, it will say in paragraph one, what do you think? So you already know where you are going to look for your answer from. Or like the GRE where you do not even know where, you are just giving a, uh, a reading passage and you are tasked to uh, find the answer on your own. Now, uh, generally I also advise that apart from, you know, maybe the uh, insert sex question or the pro summary, uh, aspects. I generally just ask you just skim through your TOEFL reading section, just get a general idea of what the um, the passage is all about, and then use your uh, um, your questions to answer to answer themselves because they will also obviously direct you to the paragraph they want you to get your answers from. And from there, you can be able to get your answers and move on. So then we have the listening section. Now the listening section has um, two two aspects. We have the lecture aspect where you're going to be listening to most likely a professor talking to a class and he's going to be telling you uh, about a specific topic. It might be about um, reproduction in, in 
mammals, for example, or it can be something about um, the socialistic um, representation of human evolution or something like that. So it's going to be a lecture. And then there is another section where it is a conversation. Now, this conversation will generally be between maybe two students talking about an issue in a school, or it can be between a graduate coordinator and a student as well. So in this place, you might have three to four lectures where you have three to five minutes and six questions to answer, or you can have, um, or as as well as two or three conversations where you have three minutes to listen and then you have five questions to answer for each conversation. Now, in this place, you have to listen attentively. Now, it is very important that you define the strategy that works for you. For some people, they believe that for them in conversation, they just want to listen and they'll be able to answer the questions. But for some others, it is better for them to take notes and identify key points. For me, the two strategies worked for me in the sense that for my lectures, I, I had to take, take notes because sometimes the lectures can be on foreign concepts you have never heard before. So those ones, in your, my brain might not be able to remember some key details in the passage. So I used to write down. So it was a little bit easier to follow through because most times they are talking about issues about transportation on campus or, or, or a new policy. So I could just listen and it was just three, um, a, a short conversation so I could uh, easily move on and without just uh, Now, I, I generally tell people that hopefully is simple. Although I won't tell you to underestimate it, I generally, as I say it's simple because as Nigerians, we grew up mostly speaking the English language. Yes, we all have our local languages and whatnot, but our language of instruction in many of our institutions is English language. So you have grown up speaking English, you have listened to English, you have written in English. So you just need to ensure that you know what to write, how to write it, and how the structure of the TOEFL is all about. Now, also in, in, uh, in preparation for your TOEFL, you can listen to podcasts, you can uh, engage in conversations on different topics with different people, you can listen to short lectures from different, different things like uh, literature, on biology, as as well to just expand your knowledge on different topics and for you to be able to not be intimidated by conversations that are away from your general uh, uh, line of study. So now the speaking section. Now, the speaking section for me was <laughs> the most difficult section for the TOEFL. And the reason was because, you know, I you are giving a short time a bad to... bad person. Rando, I don't want to be a bad for person. For time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you mean... I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> Up, I'm rounding yeah, up, yeah. I'm rounding up, I'm rounding up, I'm rounding up. After the speaking is the writing, then we, we round it up, okay? Uh, so the speaking section, yeah? So the speaking section was the most difficult for me because you are given a short time to quickly conjure up your thoughts and then uh, find a way to say it coherently to get top marks as well. So I encourage people to do as much practice in this and try to uh, share it with other people to see, to get their judgment on how well you structured your sentences in your speaking and how well you were composed and the pronunciations of words and uh, how well you can improve as well. So now, a very important thing you need to know is that you have a short amount of time to talk. So don't spend so much time trying to expatiate so much on some of the points you have given. Just stick to what the prompt is asking you to do and try to fit it into the time frame that you have given. So obviously it helps to practice, 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 and um, try as much as possible to uh, learn more about the different types that come out in the speaking section and uh, get a format of what you want to say even before the questions come out so that you are not lost thinking so much and then when the time for you to answer comes up you are you are, you are lost and then you... now for the writing section now the writing section for the TOEFL is in, is different from um, the AWA section in your GRE but there are some uh, similarities in the sense that you're going to be writing a passage, yes, and you're going to also need to learn how to type very fast on your keyboard. But in the um, TOEFL writing, you have the integrated writing, where you're going to read a, read a passage, then you listen to an audio which is going to be expatiating or giving an opinion about the passage that you just read. And then, then you're going to now write about what you heard 
from the um, audio in relation to the passage. For example, someone can write a passage about biology and then the, a, a, an audio will come out and say, oh no, this is not true about biology and these are the reasons why this is not true. So you, your own task now is just to write what you have seen and what you have heard. What did the audio say? What the, how did they counter the passage? And what do you, uh, or how do you summarize that in your writing? Then your independent writing is now texting you about how your ability to give your opinion. It is very similar to the initial tax in your AWA. And this one is just testing you on how you can think and how you can put your thoughts down into writing. Once again, I always tell you practice, 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 practice. And write as much as you can and let it, but let it make sense. Don't just be writing long sentences that have mistakes in, in their tenses and in their, in their punctuation as well. So, uh, this is just, I, I might not be able to go in depth into this because of my time before fighters comes to chase me out. <laughs> but essentially, this is what you should be aiming for with your uh, with your independent writing and with your integrated writing. With this, I believe if you uh, go do your best and try to uh, use range of vocabulary, your punctuation, as well as various other uh, things that are necessary in your essay writing, you will get as much possible marks as you can. You can even get 30 over 30 in your writing as well. So I am going to be rounding up with a couple of uh, final words, tips, and um, you know, general encouragement to everybody that is on this call and is preparing for either your GRE verbal, your AWA, or your TOEFL section. Now, very important for you in any exam that you're going to be going for in your standardized exam, try to get to your test venue on time. It helps you to settle down, to be stable and not um, be agitated before entering into the exam hall. So try to get there on time. And for your TOEFL exam as well, you know, because everybody, um, you are writing with different people. Sometimes some people can be writing the speaking section while you are writing the reading section. Or some people are doing the writing section while you are doing your speaking section. So be prepared to have different disturbances around you, but just learn how to focus well. And also in now they have this um, counseling headsets as well. So if you need to use that as well, you can always indicate and ask for help to use that. And one thing I always tell people, practice makes perfection. So just practice, 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 and you'll be moving closer to your scores. And like um, before we started this call, Faidat and I had a conversation and generally consistency is better than book preparation. So it's better for you to have two hours of practice every day than have maybe seven hours of practice in one day and then you are not doing anything for maybe one week or two weeks again. So try and do it consistently. And uh, at the end of the day, you will definitely get the score you desire. So I encourage you, you got this. And I want to be hearing good news from everybody from this course, celebrating um, their high scores in these standardized exams. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Imane. Oh my God, that was that was powerful. We'll be unable to take uh, questions right now. Just put your questions in the chat and Emmanuel and other people on the call will be able to respond to you as we need to like proceed to the next um, the next topic. Uh, Mr. President. Okay, um, so we're going to the next uh, session, writing a winning statement of purpose. And uh, it will be taken by Adewale Babatunde. And then uh, Adewale Babatunde is a 2020 high scholar who completed a bachelor's degree in petroleum and gas engineering at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. And then he's currently a chemical engineering PhD student at Kone University, USA. So it would, um, for the next uh, 20 minutes, it will be giving us, I don't know, I think 20 minutes, it will be giving us how to write state, a winning statement of purpose. So welcome uh, at the Wale Baba today. Thank you for joining us. Please, you can proceed. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you so much for the introduction, Oganel Chuko. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be amongst you all talking about this, this important topic, which is how to write a winning statement of purpose. Um, just give me a few moments. Let me pull up my slides.
Is my slide visible to everybody? Yeah, it's yeah. visible. Okay, all right, let's start there. Um, hello everyone once again. So um, yeah. So what is um, a statement of purpose you might want to ask, right? So commonly, this particular essay document is defined by prompts. So if you go to the website of many graduate programs, such as Stanford University, they have this to be the definition. Purdue University has this to be their definition. And Northeastern University also has this. And though it, it might raise some confusion that what exactly do people, do admissions committee members want to see on this document? And there is a common theme. And all of the prompts have these essential elements in them. Essentially what they want you to convey in that document is why you want to pursue graduate study and why you think now is the best time for you. Also, what do you want to do in graduate school? What has prepared you for this stage in your life? And lastly, why are you considering coming to graduate school in their own university and not elsewhere? And so in this particular document, you want to explain, you want to capture all of all these points in um, in the document. And so this um, presentation is just about letting you know a particular strategy that I applied in drafting my own statement of purpose. And you can also try to adapt that strategy as well. Um, I'm not saying it will work for everybody here, but I think it increases the chances that it will work for you um, very much. So um, why does the admissions committee of graduate school, why, why do they want you to write a statement of purpose? It is because they want to know your motivation for graduate school, right? They want to know why you want to pursue the degree that you are indicating that you want to pursue, be it master's or PhD, right? They want to know what your background is. Did you do an engineering degree? Did you do a science degree? Did you do um, you know, a humanities degree? Right? They want to know about your professional experience as well. Have you worked a while after graduating from university or not? Did you undergo any maybe professional internship during your program? And they also want to know if you've been involved in um, extracurriculars during your program. And lastly, they want to know what your goal is, what your career goal is. So quickly, in writing what I call um, the winning SOP, in the sense that this is a statement of purpose that if you intend to apply to just one program, but in multiple universities, let's say you want to apply for a PhD in material science mm -hmm. and engineering degree, right? But you want to send that application to multiple universities, you want to apply to Stanford, you want to apply to Columbia and et cetera. These tips would help you to draft what you have, a single document that you can just tweak a little bit without having to rewrite the entire document when you are applying to these universities. So to begin, this is what I advise. I think you want to list out your academic and or research activities. So um, during your undergraduate, or if you're currently still in undergrad, um, what are those academic activities or research activities that you're currently engaged in or that you were engaged in if you're out of undergrad? What I mean is that, um, if you went for an internship, did you conduct research in that internship? Um, now that you're in grad school, are you now that you're in undergrad, are you collaborating with some members of your department or faculty to work on some projects that are research-based? Or are you representing your institution in competitions, right? Where you know, like SPE, Petro Bowl, and Petro Quiz and all the like. Make a list of all these activities, right? Also, extracurricular activities that are not academic based, such as maybe you participating in departmental politics, you know, running for general secretary, president, and all that. You want to also make a list of all this. And after you have a comprehensive list of all the academic and research activities and extracurricular activities that you are involved in, you want to filter out these activities based on um, your graduate school interest. What I mean is, if you are applying for a program that is based on um, let's say mechanical engineering, you don't want to have like, at the top of your list, you don't want to have experiences that are related to, let's say, accounting. For instance, I know that some of us went to, um, 
for internship, we went to like some firms that were not really engineering based. And we have all these things as things that we list out on our resume as like work experience. So in filtering out for your grad school application, you don't want to have this at the top of your list because it's not relevant to, you know, the program you're applying to. And after you've made this filter based on the, you know, your graduate school of interest, then you want to think about how you can tell a story with what you have. Um, I'm trying to go over this slide quickly because of um, the time limitation, but I'll try my best not to gloss over too much so that you don't, you don't even get the point of it all. Um, so yeah, make a list of academic and research activities and also extracurricular activities and filter these activities. What I mean filter, sort it out, like the most important ones are the ones that are more relevant to the program that you're applying to. And the least important ones will be at the bottom of your filter. Those ones will not be part of your SOP. They can appear on your CV to kind of like support the fact that, oh, this person is a hard worker, this person has achieved these things, but they would not be in your SOP because they would not help you tell a compelling story about why you're applying to graduate school. And this is just what I think. In some cases, some people include it and it does help them, but I think for the most part, it might not. All right. So now, what is the structure of your statement of purpose? It's an essay document, so it will have the structure that any typical essay would. It would have an introduction, it would have a body, and it will have a conclusion. I'm going to take you through how you can draft these separate parts of the SOP document. Um, so in the introduction part, the introduction is typically just one paragraph, same as the conclusion, but then the body, paragraph, the body parts can be you know, many paragraphs, depending on maybe the word limits that you've been given by the graduate program, or maybe by also how much you have to write about as a person. So in the introduction part, this is what I, I, I suggest. I think we have mostly engineers in this um, webinar, so this might really apply to you the more. So you might want to think about identifying a specific problem pertaining to your field or your intended graduate you know, program field. And then you want to talk about the impact of that problem on society or on that field. And then you want to also capture the fact that it is your desire to solve that problem and effect a particular outcome that motivates you to pursue you know, further studies, be it master's or PhD. So this is one framework, one way to go about it. And I'm going to show you an example of an introduction paragraph that captures those three elements. So I like to call it um, a problem and impact framework. And if you see here, this first portion of the paragraph says, as global population growth is increasing drastically, continue with this. So this entire sentence captures, or couple of sentences capture the problem. And the next one talks about the consequence of that or the impact of that problem on society, right? And then the last part talks about a resolve that's oh, Solving these challenges is, is a long-term responsibility I would like to shoulder, and a good starting point would be to carry out cutting research. Now, this is, this is one way I think is really nice to draft an introduction paragraph for um, the grad school application. And so what I now want to do now is to point out some flaws in an introduction paragraph like this. Now, you see here that in the problem part, this person talks about, oh, Fossil fuels are expected to meet more than 50% of primary. So I think the wrong thing here is that this person did not include the source of this data. Who said fossil fuels are expected to meet more than 50%? You have to cite the source when you're making a claim like this in your introduction paragraph, because then it gives the committee a sense that, oh, you're already thinking like a researcher. You're not just making facts up, right? You are citing credible sources. The same also in the impact um, couple of sentences here that we have. It says energy will only be able to supply about 15% of the world's need by 2050. Who said so, right? So it would be nice to just like include just a citation about where this is coming from. Now, for most people, their introduction paragraph will not require them to cite any sources. But um, if you do make such a claim like this in your introduction paragraph, I recommend that you, you make reference to where you got that fact from. Yes, so um, that is about the introduction paragraph. And this is like the framework that I think would help if you do adopt. Moving on to the body paragraph, right? So in the body paragraph, after you've accomplished the task of telling them about you know, the problem, 
that you're interested in solving, the impact of that problem, you know, on society or on your field and how solving that problem is what motivates you to pursue further degrees, um, further degree, um, master's or PhD. Then you want to explain what your background is and how your background has prepared you for such a degree, right, or for, for the program. And one framework that I find helpful is this problem solution benefit framework. Notice in the first um, introduction part, we have problem impact and resolve, but here we have problem solution benefit. And so this is what I think you can, this is how I think. So I'm going to explain the multiple paragraphs that you can have under your body section. And I'm going to show you an example um, body paragraph to see how this problem, to show you how this problem solution benefit frame framework can be applied, and then we'll move on to the conclusion. So um, for instance, as an engineering student, your body paragraph, I expect, should contain um, some research work that you've done during your undergrad, or some coursework that you took in undergrad that was really interesting and that steered you to, towards a particular um, field. So it might be maybe your thermodynamics class that you just found really, really interesting and that made you get more interested in maybe thermal fluids and stuff like that. It could be some research that you did in your second year with, you know, some couple of friends that you guys worked on building a prototype for a particular um, device or, you know, whatever it could be. I think that you should capture this in your body paragraph. And you want to use this framework in terms of, you talk about the problem that you identified with your, I mean, in the case where you built a prototype, you talk about the problem that you and your friends identified and the solution you thought about providing as a result of the problem you identified and how you went about solving that problem and what the benefit was. The benefit in sense of how did it help you to think about the problem differently and how was the prototype able to, you know, solve the problem that you set out to solve initially. Also, I think you should also talk about your internship. I think it's mandatory for all engineering students in Nigeria to go undergo six months internship. So what you did in your internship might actually be something useful that can feature in your statement of purpose. For me, I did include one research project that I worked on during my internship, and I think it was really strong. Um, it, was, it made my statement of purpose strong. Also, your final year thesis is also a demonstration that you've undergone or you've underwent research experience, that you've done something pertaining to solving a problem by you know, um, reviewing the literature, doing experiments and writing the reports together. So all of all this, um, this thesis um, demonstrate that you have, you have some research experience. And also mentioning your extracurricular activities in your body paragraph is important because it presents you as a well-rounded student, mm -hmm. not just someone who is focused on academics, but someone who also has um, um, interest beyond you know, academia or has like you know, some other passions to solve, to better serve society. And lastly, in your body paragraph, you want to talk about your graduate school plans, right? So after mentioning, oh, that you did this research or you took this interesting coursework that helped you to see things differently in your undergrad, and then you underwent an internship where you were able to apply your learnings to solve a problem that further, you know, helped you get interested in this field and that you also wrote something, you're, you also worked on solving a problem during your when you're working on your thesis. And then you also were like the general secretary or the president of this society where you were able to help a couple of um, students to get access to industry mentors and you know all these things. Then what do you want to do you know, next? Why are you going to grad school? So here you talk about, okay, in line with your interest in this particular field, you want to you know, pursue advanced studies so that you can further probe this. You know, So this should feature in your body paragraph. And I think this is the right place to place it when you're drafting your, um, your statement of purpose. This is not to say that it's the best way or the best place to place it. This is just my own um, suggestion. Um, so here you talk about whether or not you want to you know, pursue a PhD and master's in the program and what you intend to do, you know, in that program, which professor would you be interested in working with and all that. And then lastly, you want to also provide a reason for why you are applying to that particular program. 
as opposed to other programs. I mean, they know that you're also applying to other programs, but you want to kind of like give them the benefit. You want to give them the assurance that um, you're applying to their own program is not a random act. It's something that you thought true and that in fact, you would really, really get like to get into their program compared to other programs that you're applying to. And one way to do this is to maybe do some lead, I mean, not even maybe, definitely do a little bit, do more digging in into the, the, the program in terms of trying to find maybe the core values of the program. Like what kind of student do they really look out for? Or what does the, the program really like? What kind of image do they like to portray about this, themselves? Institutions like MIT like to portray the perception that they attract the best scholars in the world who would solve the most difficult challenges that humanity would ever face, right? So if you're applying to a school like MIT, your reason for saying why you're applying to MIT is because after you've done your research, you know that, okay, this is what MIT likes to stand for. This is what they like to attract. Then you put such a statement like, okay, um, my, my reason for applying to MIT is because I want to, you know, to apply the part of being a very, very outstanding researcher who would solve the most difficult problem that, you know, I mean, this is just me trying to make things up. But I think if you give it more thought, it will come out better than I just suggested, but definitely be sure to explain why you are applying to that particular graduate program in your body paragraph. Okay, um, quickly moving on to an example of a body paragraph that captures um, the problem solution benefit framework is this one. So here, because of time, I will not be able to show an example for the research and coursework the TCs, the extracurricular. So I'm just picking an internship example where um, this is part of the body paragraphs, but it talks about an internship experience. Now here you can see I've highlighted the portion where the person talked about the problem and the portion where we talked about the solution and then the benefits. I'm not gonna read this out, but I'll just give you a moment to scan through it quickly. Okay, so it's evident here that this person here identified a problem with the thermal desorption units at a particular place where they did their internship. And then they were able to address that problem by trying out some simulation and you know considering certain factors. And they were able to propose a solution to that problem. And at the end of the day, they were able to get a firm grasp of unit operations and process optimization. And they also deeply enjoyed the problem, um, enjoyed resolving the company's problem using that knowledge. So this is one way to use the problem solution framework. And I think it helps to better capture what you've done. Lastly, your conclusion paragraph, which is just one paragraph, like I mentioned earlier, you want to talk about what you aim to achieve with the degree after you've earned it from that institution. That is, you want to tell them what your long-term plans are, right? And this is an example of how to, to put that together. So you say, oh, after completing my master's or PhD in this, I aspire to devote my, oh, this is an example. You don't have to say you aspire to devote your life, right? But this person says, oh, they aspire to do this and commercialize the technology, you know, and, and on and on and on. And then they expect to contribute to the body. So I think this, this, um, this portrays the message. I don't need to do some more explanation, but I think you get the point. Um, yeah, so now that we know that our statement of purpose document should contain three portions, the introduction, the body, and the conclusion, and then the body has to, you know, it's a multiple paragraph section, and how we can apply some frameworks in drafting out the introduction and the body, and how the conclusion is just a very simple thing. Just talk about what you want to do with the degree, what your long-term plans are. How do you go about writing your statement of purpose? And I mean, this is this is almost a no-brainer, but yes, you have to write. Start writing whatever thing comes to your mind when you want to, like when you know that, okay, you'll be applying to graduate schools, you know, for whatever program, you don't want to delay the writing process. Even when you feel like you don't really have something substantial to write about, it's better to start writing as soon as you've made that decision to apply. And when you've written your drafts, you know, put everything together, make some edits and proofread it and then send it to someone who can help you review it. And this person might be maybe your professors at your undergrad institution. This might be someone that is already in a graduate program, maybe the one where you want to apply to, or maybe not. But you know this person has 
gone through this particular phase and they've been able to succeed. So you want to give it to them to review and help you point out some errors or things that you can do differently to make the essay better. And then you, whatever corrections that they make, whatever advice they give to you, you want to incorporate it and then rewrite your, your statement of purpose. And then you go again, you edit and proofread it, give it back to them to review. If they still make some more suggestions that you should do, you want to think about it and then decide whether or not to incorporate it and revise it. And then, so this is, this continues on and on until you are confident that the final document you have, you know, is, is ready to be submitted. And wrapping up, these are some things that you should avoid while writing your statement of purpose. Plagiarism and grammatical blunders. It's very important that you avoid lifting up, just lifting people's ideas. For instance, I showed you an example. I'm, I'm, okay, maybe not, but some people might have taken a screenshot thinking that, oh, they'll just use those examples for their own application. But these are examples that people have already used that is like out there. And if you're applying to a program where that person has also applied to, they might actually find out that you lifted, you know, that content from somewhere else. And that's like an automatic way to, to disqualify an applicant because it shows that you can't even write things, you know, on your own. So how can you really thrive in a graduate school where you'll be on your own for most of the time, even, you know, if not all. So you don't want to plagiarize. You want to really make sure that what you're writing is your own ideas. You're putting things down based on your own um, knowledge and writing abilities. And you don't want to make grammatical blunders because it presents you in a very bad light. It shows that you're not as educated as they would want a graduate student to be. So you don't want grammatical blunders to come um, to come off in your essay. Splitting errors, um, you know, these are like minor things that we don't really pay attention to. If you're writing for long, a long period of time, there are some things that just keeps your attention. But giving your essays to people to review would, you know, help you to catch these errors that you usually um, occur. And also using like a typing assistant like Grammarly would help you catch um, errors like this. Also using ambiguous words, words that have like very, very, words that people do not come across on a normal day but you just put it in your SOP just because you want to impress the committee member. You want them to know that you are so educated. Trust me, there's that temptation to sound really, really grand. Like you just use discombobulated in that essay and you're like, mm, if they read this discombobulated, they would, ah, they will really feel me. But actually you are discombobulating them by using discombobulated. So you don't want to just um, show in really, really fancy words unnecessarily just to, to come across as sound. There are ways that you can string words together and you know string sentences together that's still going to let them know that this person is, this person knows their stuff. So resist the temptation. Yeah, you don't want to tell a very long story. So uh, starting out, I told you that after like you've been able to filter out your interests based on the program you're applying to, you want to be able to tell a story. I'm not saying that you should just say anything right the stories i mean is like when you are trying to write your essay you want to say that oh when i did this um i learned about this and this informed my decision to do this next thing and then when i did this next thing this was the outcome and then doing that next thing helped me to see things differently and then i choose mm -hmm. to do this other thing that's the way that's what i mean when i say try to string it together in the story there are some some people might interpret that to mean that, oh, they should talk about the story like, oh, I joined um, the University of Benin in 2019. I was a fresher then. I didn't really know much about the program. And they, no, that's that's not what I'm trying to say. Right. So don't tell irrelevant stories. What I mean is just try to make your points connect as opposed to someone saying in my undergrad, I did research in this field for my internship. I did this research. For my thesis, I know you're just listing things out. Don't don't do that for your SOP, right? Let them see that this person is is driven, and that the outcomes of the things that they do kind of like has an impact on the next steps that they, you know, that they take. Um, yeah. Lastly, avoid writing late. There is always the urge to to delay the writing process, like I said earlier. That oh, I need to gather more facts. I need to, you know. Before I start writing, don't do that. The last minute writing usually turns up to be really crappy. There are a lot of things that will skip your attention. You know, you just, it, it won't be the best version of what you want. So please do avoid it. And as a, as a reference for 
writing the statement of purpose, I think one very good resource that I found helpful as well was this document by Donald Asher. It's called the Graduate Admissions Essay Text, right? It's really good. It, it breaks down a lot of concept for you. It tells you what most graduate schools are looking like. It tells you things that have worked for many students in different disciplines like engineering, medicine, you know, and whatnot. And, you know, also provides some of the advice that I've already mentioned in this presentation. And you want to, <laughs> you want to use Grammarly to help you catch spelling errors, right? Um, kindly know that I did not put chat GPT as a resource to use, guys. That's not a mistake. It's intentional. <laughs> so I think that you would do yourself a disservice if you use an AI software to write your statement of purpose. Okay. So Grammarly is just to help you catch your typing errors, your typos, so that you know they don't they don't creep in. And final tips. It is helpful to adopt a storytelling method. Trust me, you don't just want to list out your accomplishments on your statement of purpose because those accomplishments would already be on your CV. So you don't want to duplicate a document. Your SOP is, is an opportunity for you to give meaning to your accomplishments. It's an opportunity for you to breathe life into your CV. Let them know why you've done all of the things that you've done and why that is relevant for your, you know, your decision to apply to graduate school. And remember to use this problem solution binary framework in your body paragraphs. Um, it's it's helpful. I, I adopted it and it really helped me. I mean, um, yeah, it did it did help. And lastly, be humble. Be humble in how you talk about your accomplishments. I mean, if you haven't won a Nobel Prize yet and you're writing to someone who most likely, I mean, you're a member of the admission committee that has won a Nobel Prize is even saying that. Even me, I don't write like this, but this person is writing this way. Uh, let me show you an example of what I mean by be humble in your statement of purpose. Um, I'll go back to this conclusion paragraph. And yeah, so you see here in the second to the last sentence here, this person says, I count myself lucky to be on the path to creating a better world for posterity. This person could have, I mean, given the many amazing things that I believe they must have written in their body paragraphs, it's probably obvious to the committee that this person deserves to be on this path, right? But the person just says, oh, despite that, I consider myself lucky. I count myself fortunate, you know, to be, I could have been elsewhere, but, you know, so this is one way to let humility come true in your writing. And I think it appeals to um, the admissions committee because, you know, academic, <laughs> academics have egos. So when they see people bragging, it kind of like bounces off somehow, you know, on them and everything, but I don't know what it might not, but I'm just saying to be on the on a very um safer side, just try not to brag too much, you know, in your statement of purpose. This is not to say you shouldn't present yourself in a positive light, right? This is not to say you shouldn't talk about what you've done, saying that you did it. I'm not saying you should always say, and by the grace of God, I was able to do it. You don't have to say that, but it's just like you know, ways that you can phrase certain um, sentences can come across as, oh, this person is just um, a little too, too much. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. I, I hope it was helpful. Very, uh, very happy practical. To... Uh, have... yes. I keep learning. I keep learning from you, Adiwali. Uh, <laughs> you have to start reviewing the essays I write in this grad school. Uh -uh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the attention. Um, so I'm just gonna stop sharing now. Mm. But if you have questions, please put it in the chat box. I'll pass it on to the president now. Okay. Okay. Um, I think there are some questions. Uh, we'll try to respond to them in the chat as okay. much as we can. Yeah. Okay, so let's move to the next uh, speaker because of time. Um, the next speaker would uh, she was here yesterday session. So, um, Alaja Ojo, she'll be Alaba Ojo. Sorry, Alaba Ojo. Sorry, are, you sure you're, are you sure you're in Nigerian? Because <laughs> <laughs> I heard Alaja. Alaba, no, I, th I thought it was a J. Okay, mm. Alaba Ojo. Uh, she'll be speaking on academic CV, resume, and uh, recommendations later. And then 
Okay, I believe you can see the screen. She's uh, a PhD candidate in the Department of Chemical Engineering, University of South Carolina, USA. And then in 2016, she obtained a Bachelor of Science degree with the class honors from the Department of Chemical Engineering, University of Benin. And then I research, our current research is on heterogeneous catalysis with applications of clean energy. She loves volunteering and is passionate about helping others find your feet in your graduate school process. So, uh, Ms. Alaba Ujo, thank you very much for joining us again. Yeah, uh, we look you. forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I you can go ahead and share my slides. Okay. So uh, I'm Alaba, as you introduced me, and today I'm going to be talking about um, CV, resume, and recommendation letter. And I think the first thing I should do is to uh, tell us what a CV is. I know most of us know what a uh, CV is, but basically it's the summary of your qualifications, um, your education, your, your achievements in your career so far. So you just put it together um, in a document. But I know one question that often comes um, to people's mind is what's the difference between CV and resume? Um, and I just wanted to clarify that. I think it depends. Um, on where you are using it, like which part of the world you are using it. Uh, in the US, they could be considered slightly different, the resume and the CV. Um, the, and in places like UK, some parts of Europe, um, CV and resume can be used interchangeably to, um, not interchangeably, they can be used to mean um, both. So basically, as um, if you are in U if you are applying to schools in the UK or some parts um, of Europe, when they say resume, they mean CV. When they say CV, they mean CV. It's the same thing. In South Africa, Australia, India, and some other places, um, CV and resume can um, be used inter interchangeably. Um, but also, people classify resume to be short shorter than CV. So CV is, you know, more detailed. But um, bringing it down to why we are here, graduate school, um, I would say that CV is more closely related to um, when you're applying for an academia kind of um, job or applications like graduate school, resume mostly used for industry. So I just wanted to clarify that. But I would say that at this stage where we are now, <laughs> probably all our achievements, maybe, I'm just saying, might fit into one or two pages. So feel free to use it interchangeably as far as you have the summary of all your achievements. Um, so far, next slide, please. Okay, now, um, Adewale Babatunde just talked about, you know, SOP, right? And someone asked in the chat box, um, I guess it would be, you know, useful to write down points before drafting your statement of purpose. And I would say that a way for you to write down points before drafting your statement of purpose will be to draft out your CV. So just, you know, sit down and think about yourself and think about, since secondary school till now, what have I done every year of my life? And just draft it down in the form of a CV. So after secondary school, you got into university in your undergrad level. Did you participate in any research work? Did you do any internship? Did you do, you know, did you volunteer and all of that? So just sit down and think about all the years of your life with dates. 20 these, what was I doing? And write it down. And then you can now organize them into sections as I'm going to talk about now. So for a CV, um, generally or typically, you have these sections. You have, you have to, the first, the very first thing, you have your name and you know, your LinkedIn details, your email, your phone number at the top of your uh, CV. And then the next thing will be your career objective or professional summary. So that just like summarizes, you know, I just want to have a glimpse about you. So what do you have to say about yourself? So there you can highlight your key strengths, you know, what you're passionate about. You could say um, you have the ability to multitask with specifics. Don't just use general terms without putting specifics about you. And most importantly, for the purpose of graduate school application, you want to state um, 
the area you are interested in. I'm interested in research in heterogeneous catalysis, or I'm interested in research in drug discovery, for instance. So a summary is just like two to four um, lines, about two sentences is enough for a professional summary. Of, um, and that should capture your research interests. And then the next stage would be your education so far. So you have a, um, a master's degree so you are going to categorize it based on um, the most recent experience you have under, under your education. I mean, if you just got your master's degree, you should put that before your undergraduate degree below. Um, and then you're gonna put in the, the school you um, finished, you got that degree from the year of graduation. And if your GP is very great, like very good, I recommend you to put your CGPA there you know, preferably on a four point scale if you're applying to the US. Um, but if you don't know what your GP is on a four point scale, you can still put it there on a five point scale. So if you have a very good class rank, let's say you're a top 3%, top 5% of your class, you might want to um, put it there top. But if let's say you are top 50% of your class, I don't think it's necessary for you to, um, to mention that. So basically just, you know, you can even put in bold the things that, you know, that shows if uh, that you have, you know, had good grades in the past or a very good performance, you can highlight them. But if, if it's not so great, it's better to just, you know, keep it low um, under that section. So you list all your education and then on that skills, what skills do you have you, you know, what skills do you have your research, could be research skills if you've used you know equipments that are very relevant to the um, lab you are intending to join you need to list those skills that you have you could also put some software programming skills most especially for those that want to do computational research but even if you're not doing computational research and you have those skills even if it's Microsoft Office that you know how to use PowerPoint, those things are also useful for research and reporting. So you can also list them. So you can have under skills, you can have subsections, you can have the research skills, the software and programming skills and the personal attributes or soft skills. That's where you talk about, you know, maybe you, you have the ability to work in team, you know, to work with a team. And if you have specifics on that, you can, you know, write that specific um, detail. Then research experience and teaching experience. These two sections are very important for graduate school. Very, very important, research and teaching experience. So if you have research experience, of which I think everybody does, your undergraduate project or your master's project is a research experience. So you're going to write, um, you're going to write that down, the details. Um, I think it's it would be good for me to, or let me just scan through this slide before moving on. Your teaching experience, if you taught during your NYSC, for instance, in a secondary school, you're going to, you know, list, you know, the name of the school, the date, and you don't need to write things like, um, so, so, so local government area. So if you are applying outside the country, I think it's okay to just put the name of the city and the country where you got that experience. And so aside the research and teaching experience, you have a section other work experience. Maybe they are not so relevant to graduate school. So you just have it under that section. For some people, they don't have a lot of research and teaching experience. So they just create one heading that has, you know, you can just create one heading and it, it's work experience. And on that day, you're going to have something that say, oh, you were a research assistant or, or you undergraduate researcher, just like that. So it depends on you and how much experience you have. If you have much experience in a particular session, it's okay to create a section for um, that experience. And of course, honors and award, if you have honors, you create a session. You don't want to create a session if all you have in that section is just one thing. So I would say find a way to put it somewhere else if it's only one achievement. I would. That's my personal um, opinion. Conference presentations and publications. If you have publications, great. Write the name of the journal, the year, the co-authors, and then you can write your own name in bold 
to point them to um, to say this is um, your publication as well. If you don't have publications, presentations, if it's not a conference, like a known conference, it's not a, a very formal you know, setting. It could even be your classroom presentations. I remember in my final year in chemical engineering, we usually do class presentations. And I had that listed out, the topics I presented on and researched on, even if they were group presentations. Um, because when I was applying for graduate school in my time, I didn't have um, a publication. So I had an editing um, that had presentations. And then I listed the presentations I did. That was helpful as well. Volunteering experience. I like to volunteer a little, so I have lots of volunteer experience. Some people don't have um, volunteer ex volunteering experience. So perhaps you don't have anything to put in that section. But I would say that if you're still in the early years of your um, undergraduate program or master's program or anything, always find ways to volunteer or to gain leadership experience and all of these things. If I were to, if, I to, if I'm to use an example now, the Nuesa president, uh, Tega, and maybe the people who planned this, this is an example of a volunteering experience um, and leadership as well. And then under these experiences, they are going to you know, have bullet points to say, we were able to organize a seminar to help people in their academic pursuit and we had, up to 100 people in attendance, you know, something like that. So try to get um, leadership and volunteering experience because it's even important as well in the US. They want to see that aside being a bookworm, you also do, you know, extracurricular stuff. And then professional membership, if you're part, if you're part of NUESA, you're part of, you know, NSCHE, SPE, and all of these um, organizations. That's why it's good to be a member pay your membership due and <laughs> so you can have it on your CV as well. And um, I have talked about some of these things, but I just want to give um, an example for the research experience part of the, okay, yeah, professional summary. This is an example of a professional summary, except that I don't think this was very, you know, it's very peculiar to graduate school, but you want to put in somewhere, maybe after talking about, oh, I have experience in this, 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 in social research, then at the end, you might want to say, my research interest is in so, 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 so. Yeah, if you're very sure about your interest or there, are, you just want to show yourself, you know, the summary should say why this thing is relevant to the committee. Why, why is it, um, why do you have, what's your summary? What, what are you trying to achieve with this CV, basically? So you can say, my research interest in this is, and this is the type of person I have. I have these skills and all of that. Next slide. Yes. Okay. Now, I talked about different sections, right? And I, I talked about, you know, when your research experience, your teaching experience, it's important that under those experiences that you have bullet points to explain what you did, what your achievements were. During, during that experience. Don't just say, um, I was a research assistant with doctor. Nobody knows doctor this, unless doctor, I, because I've seen it in many CVs applying to graduate school. I was a research assistant with doctor, Gene, this, this, this. I, I would say, no, it's even better to say, I was a research um, assistant for my undergraduate professor. Then you can put the professor's name if you want. And then you state what you achieved. So if you look at, the teaching assistant example, it says tutored over 190 40 year chemical engineering. These are specifics and I could really believe that this person had, you know, this experience. And it didn't end that, you know, what was the result when you taught these people? It says resulting in their ability to confidently interpret several separation problems. And then went on to give specifics such as flash distillation, Without doubt, I would know that this person, you know, had this experience. You don't want it to be too long. You want it to, you know, to be interesting to read, to have numbers, to have specifics. If you did something and you were able to achieve 98% performance, you know, those specifics are important for you to have in each um, bullet point. I don't know if I should mention how many bullet points you should have under each session. I think it depends on you and what, um, what, amount of information you have to put on your CV. If you have too many things already, two bullet points for each section is okay for you to you know, state the details or one even uh, depends on you. Okay, uh, 
Yeah, next slide. Yeah. Now, do's and don'ts of CV. Typically, when people send you their CV, you see like the typical um, Nigerian fashion CV, like the state they are date of birth and you know 1990s nobody wants to see that some people even state the agenda i would say for gender it, it, if you're applying for a course where maybe there are only let's say you you are a female in engineering and you want to sell yourself in that light maybe in your sop you you could mention that like as a female in engineering it's not you know typical for people to study engineering as females but you know despite the you know blah 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 i was able to stand out but that's fine but you don't need local government of origin nobody's going to pin you down to your local government of origin in your um, so it's okay at the top to have your name, your surname, um, your phone number, your email. And um, if you are on LinkedIn, you can put your LinkedIn you know, ID there. Of course, do use bullet points like I showed you. Keep it short and neat. Let it be organized. If you have your dates, the dates you got those experience, you make it nice. You can keep them, let's say, to the extreme right or the same pattern. You know, keep the same font style, you know, that sort of thing. Don't, your CV when on, on one look should be nice. Someone should even want to go through everything. And of course, keep it relevant to graduate school. That's why, like um, Adewale Babatunde said, he said that, you know, the most, um, what's most important to graduate school is what you should have on your SOP. The same thing for your CV, what's most relevant. You can, um, keep the others below your CV, like at the bottom, basically. What is most relevant, keep it at the top, and then what's not so relevant, keep it below. Um, take time to proofread your work. Take time to read it, just like your SOP, you send it to people to help you review. Don't tell lies, don't lie on your CV. That's my recommendation because when you are doing this graduate school, some of these schools ask you for interview and you must be able to explain what you said your experience are in you know, some of the things you wrote on your CV. Of course, do talk up the truth. If you have, you know, an experience, you know, polish it, polish it. It might seem to you like, ah, I just taught, you know, five students. You don't, you know, taught students in so, 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 and they were able to, what's important is what was the achievement from that experience? Talk up your truth, but don't tell a lie. Of course, choose a structure or format that works for you. What do I mean by this? Some people have more research experience than others. You know, they want to portray, you know, that first than they are, you know, only two bullet points of honors and awards. So choose a structure that works for you and, you know, work with that. Uh, and I think that that's the summary for CV. If you have any question, we can talk about that. Moving on to recommendation later. Am I too fast? Am I too slow? <laughs> How much time do You're I have? You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so recommendation later. Uh, and okay, so recommendation letter, I feel it's very important, you know, for your graduate school application because it's not in your hands, I would say, partly not in your hands, but um, it's not in your hands to make it great, but you, you can contribute to making it great. And recommendation letter is what makes you stand out. A lot of people that are applying for the same thing you are applying for, they have great GP you know, they have, you know, social achievements and everything. This is an opportunity to, you know, so basically the more competitive a program you are applying to, the more your recommendation letter would count because everybody has this, they are confused on who to choose, but maybe the recommendation lecture letter from your boss, from your lecturer um, would help you. So it's important for you to get your recommendation letter from someone who knows you very well rather than a famous person in your community, you know, or a, a big man works in total, works in shell. This is, but do you have experience with that person? Can the person tell a story about you? So do they know you well enough? And also it's important to have a nice person. Some of them want to give you a glimpse about what they've written about you. And um, a common question is, who should I choose as a recommender? Should I choose my lecturer or sh should I choose the person I work with? I would say for the purpose of graduate school, most of your recommenders should come from your, you know, academic setting, your undergraduate lecturer, your master's lecturer, it could be your project supervisor, it could be, you know, 
uh, the professor that is in charge of laboratory, you know, research or something, it's, I think it's better to have your recommendation letter from those people. Most schools require two or three recommendation letters. So you can do two from your university, one from maybe your current place of work or where you did your internship, you know. But if you have no, doesn't mean you should not apply if you have no relationship with any of your lecturers. Of course, make do with what you have. I'm just telling you that it's best to get it from a, an academic setting because of course you are applying for an academic program. And an effective letter should show depth of knowledge of the candidates. The person writing your recommendation letter has to say a story about you. The person shouldn't just say, oh, Alaba is a smart girl. What scenario, has she? when did she portray that? Oh, when I taught her, chemical reaction engineering, I remember her asking this question, which is often, you know, a question of concern for a lot of people in the field. And this is, this is, this is, you know, or I remember when, just say something specifics about the student. Don't just say she's a smart young girl and I believe in her. Mm -mm. What is the specific? What's, you know, did she have B in your class in a semester and then she put in her best the next semester and got an A? So we need your, the people recommending you, you have to let them know that these people need specifics about you. So this letter should address your intellectual capacity, your work habits, your social skills, your preparation. Your lecturer should be able to say, oh, I am confident that this person is ready for graduate school and this is why. I think so. And it's important for them to rank you in, the con in a greater context. What do I mean? If you say this student um, is in the top 10% of our class, you should be, the person writing your recommendation letter should be able to go on to say of which most people in our program or 20% of people in our program usually have, you know, success in their graduate school, just something, you know, not just in a local con context alone, if your recommender could extend it as well, that would be good. Mention, the person should mention your academic achievements. And if you don't, if you're not like a very excellent student, the person can decide to focus on something that you have been successful at, you know, you know something like that. And the, the person can mention your experience as a proctor, you proctored for an exam, you were a teaching assistant, or you helped in the lab research assistant, or you were helping the department for some services. The person, you know, these are things that graduate school um, like. So I, I read somewhere that small faults, the person should not just all talk about the good things about you. The person can mention a small fault, like, if she spends too much time on volunteering and extracurricular activities, but our academic performance are excellent. I don't know about that. I don't think I want anybody to say this <laughs> about me, but I mean, that's what I read. It's good to, you know, say something not so bad, you know, extracurricular activity and volunteering is also a great thing, helping the community. And the person should say the positives you know, despite this, this is this. Uh, and most importantly, the conclusion of your recommendation letter, the person should be able to predict that you would excel in graduate school, the bright future of the student as a scholar, as a professional in his career, and that you're going to be very outstanding. In summary, for someone to be able to write this letter about you, next slide, please. For someone to be able to write a, this kind of letter about you, you must be able to, some of your lecturers don't even remember you. you. So one way to guide them is to send them your transcript. Maybe you did a class that you performed where under that lecturer, you send them, if you still have the graded work, something that shows performance, you, you send them your resume, your SOP draft, just a rough draft, the person to have an idea of, you know, more information about you. Um, so that the person can craft his own. Of course, the person be careful not to use the same word so it doesn't look like. And I think it's important for it to be your draft of SOP and not the main thing so that there's no word for word. Give your recommender recommenders less work to do. What I mean is, even if it requires, you know, drafting your, you know, what is important that graduate school know about you and then the person can whoever is recommending you can edit and work on it and remove and add what he wants to do. And I guess it's okay for your recommenders to customize your recommendation letter. Some schools, you know, they ask the person recommend you specific question. They will say comment on this student's teaching 
and research experience. You don't want someone to just submit a recommendation letter that didn't give much detail on the topic, you know, um, that the school is requesting for. So somehow your recommender should be able to read the prompt and, you know, respond to it. And in some cases, recommendation letters don't have to be uploaded as um, PDF or just as they are. They ask specific questions. Sometimes they are required to tick, um, you know, on a scale of, they will have like, I think top 25%, top 50%, top 100 percent you'll say on based on research skill how would you grade grade this student of course it's better to be in the top 10 percent than to be in the top 90 percent of your class um i believe this is it and if there are any questions i'll be happy to attend to them thank you for listening thank you so much alaba so if we have questions let's put in the chat box and uh we have one more speaker and after that if you still want to unmute and like ask your questions we'll be happy to take them so um okay um hello can you hear me yes okay so we're going to the last uh, speaker for today's session and then our speaker here is to say I can I today I can today sorry yeah, that's good that's good um uh, she'll be speaking on Asian graduate school interviews and then to say Miss to she has a, a BSc and a MSc from Department of Industrial and Production Engineering University of Ibadan Nigeria and then she was a 2021 high scholar who later proceeded to the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, University of Toronto, Canada. So this is this is slightly different from the one we have. Uh, for some reason, we can't hear you anymore. So, um. Okay, and we cannot really hear him. So Tosin, thank you so much for your muted, Tosin. Oh, you cannot unmute yourself. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize that. You should be able to now. Okay, great. Yeah, perfect. Okay then. So uh Tosin, thank you so much for accepting to be here. And we're very, very excited to listen to you. So I'll stop sharing so you can share your screen now. All right, thank you. Okay, so. Um, sorry, trying to navigate. Sorry, I know you're seeing a different screen. I'll quickly. It's still coming up actually. We oh, okay. Screen yet. Can you see my screen now? Uh, so we can like see the directory and not the PowerPoint. Oh, uh, OK. Sorry, sorry. Um, come on. If you want to stop sharing first, then try to. OK, let me just stop sharing. Let me stop sharing. Stop sharing. I'm so sorry. No, that's OK. I don't know why I'm always having issues with this shit. Oh, this is not so good. I'm sorry, just a moment, no, please. That's fine. No, just a moment. I'm so sorry. Yeah. 
So um, okay, so as as I as I start to share my screen, I would want to use this opportunity to thank High Scholar for um, the opportunity to be here, even in Canada. It's a great journey coming, the mentorship, and every support i really really want to say thank you and i would also want to say thank you to um the organizers of this program for having me here as well so thank you everyone i'm not sure why i'm having a little bit of yeah trouble. that happens a lot that's so fine please everyone so... i'm sorry while you're fixing that, I think we'll just go through some of the questions that I can see here. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, do we have a specific number of pages for a CV for grad school? So typically, uh, I think Alaba mentioned you don't want your CV to be more than two pages. Honestly, as um, we're just starting, you know, just finished undergrad. I'm not sure you even have so much to fill up two pages, right? So... It is even advisable for you to have just one page CV. So uh, in the IA Scholar Guide, which is on ISI website, you can download that for free. We have a template there that, can, uh, that you can use to develop your academic CV. It's just a one page template and I, you should be fine with that. Uh, does published articles written in your field of study count as research work or? Okay, I think your screen your screen is coming up. Yeah, I'm trying to hope on the sorry. Does it count published articles written in your field count as research work or publications you could add to your CV? I mean it's both. If you've published that article, you did research to publish that article. So the research you did would be in your research experience, while like the articles, um, is it DOI or citation or whatever that is, would be under publications. But under research experience, you should discuss more about what you did in that, like, res the research that you actually, like, um, did and all that. Uh, Sorry, can you, share, can you see my screen now? Uh, I think it's still the directory, but I see you try to open the PowerPoint. Yeah, book. and it's opened here. Sorry. You need to, you need, I think you need to reshare. So you're sharing uh, the directory and not the PowerPoint. So try to stop sharing then. Select the PowerPoint. So someone that has a good profile oh, that can wait. be more than two pages. Trust me, if you, even if you have the best profile, it can still fit two pages. Okay, so. Good. I'll just stop since Tosin's um slide is up now and I'll hand it over to Tosin. Okay, thank you so much. I am glad to be here. And again, apologies for the issues, technical issues, I would say. Um, so again, my name is Tosin and I'll be talking today about async graduate school interviews. Um, first of all, I would want to say that this is more like I don't want to say the grand finale of everything that you have been learning since yesterday in terms of starting um, how to like search for schools and how to write quality emails and how to write your CVs and how to pass, how to haste your GRE and your TOEFL. And um, in response to getting cold emails, you are asked to like, oh, can I have a chat with you by your prospective supervisor? So what we'll be discussing now, we'll be addressing how you need to like prepare for that. And um, once you've applied, if for adventure you are asked by your admission committee to, oh, can we have a meeting with you or can we have a chat with you? So whatever we're gonna be discussing now would address how you're going to be preparing for that. So um, today we're gonna to be looking at types of interviews, tips to prepare for, your, for the formal interview, tips to prepare for the informal interview, sample questions and following up like what do you do to follow up after you've um after you've had your like first uh, sorry your informal interview or your interview with your prospective supervisor um can you all hear me yes we can hear you okay perfectly thank you so uh so to put this how there first i would want to say that so 
while it is important that we learn this process of preparing for um, graduate school interview, it is important to also know that it is not all graduate students who uh, were successful in their admission in the admission process it is not all of them that had to do an interview so having to do an interview or having to speak with a prospective supervisor all of that is dependent on the policy of the school in terms of do you even have to um get um do you even have to like reach out to a prospective supervisor do you do you have to do this um um do the admission committee do they have to like reach out to you so it depends on the the policy of the school and um um the type of assistantship they provided if either it's going to be provided by this by the department or maybe by your prospective supervisor but in all why we prepare for this process the whole graduate school admission process it is go it is good to like go with all our arsenal everything we need to do everything we need to know it's good to prepare um and do everything and i mean dot our highs and cross our t's so why interview why do you think um there is need for an interview and i have some points here so graduate school interviews are opportunities for your prospective supervisor to know if you are a great fit for their lab remember yesterday hafiz mentioned that oh you've written you are i mean how to write a code email and you've written this beautiful code email to your supervisor um to a prospective supervisor and thankfully they reached out to you oh there's a space in our lab right and um you can how can we can I have can I have a chat with you or you probably be the one to request that oh you don't mind if you can have a meeting with them so this meeting between you and your prospective supervisor is an opportunity for them to know if you're a great fit for their lab it is also an opportunity for your admission committee to know if you're a good fit for their program so during your admission process you have been sent um, like as I mentioned earlier you are being sent a mail that oh Congratulations, please could you provide us some days and times that we can meet with you, you know, so your admission committee wants to meet with you and it is an opportunity for them to know if you are a good fit for their program as well. And now how does that, um, how is that an advantage to you? It is an opportunity for you as a prospective student to know that, to know if, to assess if this um, prospective supervisor will be a good fit for you. So it's not just about your prospective supervisor trying to understand, oh, is this person good? You also want to assess if the supervisor is a good fit for you. You also want to know if the program is the best fit for you, especially when it comes to a time where you are getting several interviews from prospective supervisor or from different admission committees from different schools, right? So. Definitely, you are only going to be able to go to one school Hello, out of all the opportunities that you might have. I mean, all the schools that you might have the opportunity to go to. So the question is, how do you make this choice? It starts from your meeting with your prospective supervisor. It starts from your meeting with your admission committee. So you really want to assess from our conversation. Am I sure I can work with this, um, this supervisor for the next um, three to five years of my life? So graduate school is all about fits. Do I fit here? And um, they are also assessing if you fit, if you're going to be like fitting into their program. Now let's talk about the types of interviews that um, we can have. So we can have the informal interview, and um, like I mentioned earlier, this is a type of interview you have with your prospective supervisor. Um, before I continue, I want to be sure that um, everyone is listening. Please, can you hear me, or am I too fast? Uh, very good pace. We can hear you. Uh, please respond to us through the chat box so she knows that you're following. Thank you so much, Faida. Thank you so much. So um, um, informal interview is a type of interview you have with your prospective supervisor. Remember, it starts from the code email that we spoke about yesterday. So usually um, it occurs after you get a response to your code email and maybe before your, uh, your application to the school. So you send this code email, you have been saying um, the supervisor want to have a chat with you. You haven't even applied to the school at all, right? So it could occur before you apply to the school. And it can sometimes occur after you have submitted your application. And how do I mean? So sometimes you probably send a code email to this um to this school and 
nobody responded. So I have an experience where I have sent code emails to the school, um, to some supervisors in the school, and non nobody responded out of all of the supervisors I sent to. Because I just want to apply, I decided to apply to that school anyways, right? I felt I was a good fit and I wanted to apply. So I did apply. So eventually the supervisor, one of the persons I had sent code emails to sent me a message after I had already applied. So sometimes it could occur after you've applied and that's probably after the uh, prospective supervisor even had a chance to like look at your SOP that was just explained earlier. Or it might even be that this supervisor or whoever is going to send you an email, a prospective supervisor, you probably didn't even reach out to them. But they saw your application, they saw your profile, they, they feel that, oh, this person might be a good fit in our lab and they just reach out to you. So th those kind of meeting or this kind of meeting can actually happen after you have submitted your um, application. And um, it provides an opportunity for prospective supervisor to assess your preparedness for graduate school work in their lab. So here you are, you've, you've um, you know, say all of these things in your SOP, you send them your CV or resume, you said all these beautiful things about yourself. So it's an opportunity for them to, to really see that, okay, are you prepared to leave the continent of Africa to come to this place? Are you ready for the kind of graduate work, um, the, 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 the kind of work we do in our lab? So it's an opportunity to have a conversation around that and see that, oh, this person is really ready, right? So um, it's also an opportunity for them to discuss, for your prospective supervisor to discuss admission process, Funding opportunity may also be discussed here. I remember someone asking a question yesterday that, oh, do I mention that I want funding and all of that? And Afis responded that you necessarily don't have to mention that because almost all uh, prospective um, supervisors know that you need funding, right? So this is an opportunity for them to discuss the funding opportunity they have. And like I said, I'm going to be leaning so much on my experience. I remember, uh, I think the first or second meeting I had with one of my prospective supervisors then, um, um, uh, they came up with the fact that uh, I don't think I have funding right now to like fund um, a second PhD student, but I'm looking forward to a grant, right? So I knew that, okay, this might be a green light. There is no funding right now, but at least there is a grant coming up that could cover, you know, the cost of everything. So, and it's like I said, it's an opportunity to see if you'll be funded or not. So um, it also provides an opportunity to initiate and continue a bonding process. And this is very key. So you met with the supervisor, you've talked about your interest and they liked you, you like them and it shouldn't just end there, right? You want to like continue a bonding process. So that first interview or that first meeting you have with your prospective supervisor is an opportunity to begin a relationship. I mean, this is, this might be the person you're going to be spending, um, you're going to be working in their lab for three to five years, right? So it's an opportunity to start a bonding process. Oh, you're interested in, in their work. That's like maybe one of the first, one of the first step and what goes on. And I, I mean, it goes on from there, right? So prospective supervisors are key factors in your graduate school admission success. So like I said, for some school, you literally have to have a supervisor to be able to, um, you know, get funded or get admitted in the school. Right. I um like I'm I am so sorry I'm leaning so much on my experience, but I remember uh in the department I am right now at the University of Toronto, it was stated specifically on the departmental website. You have to have a supervisor to like get admitted. So it is more like, okay, I need to get a supervisor and I need to seal this relationship with my supervisor from the first interview I'm going to be having with this person. So this is um, the informal interview. Now let's move on to the formal interview. And this is the type of interview you have with your admission committee. And when I mean admission committee, I mean, okay, like I mentioned earlier, you've submitted your application. So some schools or some departments, depending on the way their admission process is, they want to like meet up with their prospective students as part of the selection process, they want to meet up with some um, prospective students and assess them. So most times 
um, this kind of interview or call after you've submitted your application. And the good news is that it signals that you have at least passed a level of shortlisting and your application is, a, is competitive, right? So imagine there are like hundreds of people that apply to that same department. And for them to have actually said, oh, you can, can, can we have a meeting? Can we have a chat with you? Can we have a meeting with you? That means somehow you've had some, like the first or second stage of the shortlisting process, right? So it's just a signal to you that, okay, I think I'm getting there. And of course it's a good news, but then, you still need to prepare for this because like every other person, you are still in a competition with other candidates as well. So committee usually, um, cons admission committee usually consists of at least two faculty members. Unlike where you have just a one-on-one -on -one discussion with your prospective supervisor in your uh, in the informal interview, here you have at least two faculty members. And most of the time it could include the departmental chair that is HO the head of the department, and it could include the program coordinator and some other professors within the department, right? So the main purpose of your uh, of this formal interview is to evaluate you and see if you're a good fit for their program. Remember, um, we just discussed the SOP, we just discussed the CV. You submitted all of this. You submitted your recommendation letter during your when you when you were applying. You submitted your CV, your recommendation letter, your um, your SOP, and they've gone through all of this. So now is the time for them to put a face to everything that they have been discussing. And by face, they really want to see that whatever you say you have here is this who you are. Can you defend them? Like can can you can you really defend it? And it's actually a very um a very important uh, important process in the evaluation in the um admission process such that they also want to know that the students we are coming to we are saying to to come and start their program in fall or or spring are really good fit for this program and the student we are really going to be funding are really we are really sure that these people can excel and can thrive in this program right so, but the uh, and a caveat to all of this is that why both formal and informal interviews do not guarantee, and I will repeat, do not guarantee an admission and a funding. They signal steps in the right direction. So, um, what I'm trying to say is that yes, you have gotten this good response from your from your. Um, prospective supervisor, you've had this interview with them. You also have gotten a good response from your admission committee. You've had this interview with them. The fact that you have all these things do not guarantee that you have funding already. It's not an admission letter. It's not an automatic admission. It's not an automatic funding. You are still as, you are still as like, you're competing just like every other person. Let's not even forget that the prospective supervisor you just had an interview with could have shared um, scheduled like two more interviews with other people and probably uh, just have like capacity to um, have two uh, MSc students, two master students or two PhD students in their lab, right? So you're just keeping your fingers crossed, but the good part is the fact that um, it's more like a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Now, to prepare for your um, informal interview, these are the things that you need to put at the back of your mind. Remember, informal interview is the interview you have with your prospective supervisor, and you sent a cold email. That is even if you, that is if you have not applied, and um, they ask you that can we have a chat. So you want to remember the key points you wrote in your cold emails. You want to remember. I mean, the interest you said you have in your supervisor's work, the paper you read and what really attracted you to the supervisor, what is your motivation? Why do you want to come to graduate school? You probably had put that in your code email as well, right? So you really want to remember how that you want to have them at the back of your mind, right? You also want to say, remember some of the things you already said in your CV, your leadership skills, your your soft skills that you're bringing to their lab, right? It might be some softwares that you know how to use. And if you don't know how to use some softwares at that point, it might be your writing skills. All of those things are really tangible. The, the good part is sometimes the things we ignore as skills are really 
um, useful in graduate school, right? So you want to like bring that to the table by the time you are coming to this interview. Now you want um, another point is that you want to um, ensure that you display your understanding about the program in an intellectual way at every meeting. So like I said earlier, it might not be just one meeting that you might have with your supervisor, I mean, prospective supervisor. Remember, I mentioned something about the bonding process. You have this um, first meeting and subsequently you might exchange a number of correspondence via mails and all of that. And at every correspondence, you want to ensure that you are displaying some understanding of, you know, the research that this person is working on. You want to keep abreast with what the supervisor is doing. You want to ask questions. And this brings me to, back to my next point. You want to, if, if, okay, sorry, if you ask any question, you want to answer them with confidence. And by confidence, right, you probably will be talking to um, someone you've never talked to in your life. You, you probably will be talking to some you know, white persons and all of that, but it doesn't matter. The most important part of it is that we are all humans, right? And you, you just want to portray your points as you're asking your questions. You want to maintain high contact. You want to you know, answer with confidence. You don't want to cower in and feel like, oh, right? <laughs> I am this low and you are this high. Why you want to show some, you know, some level of humility, you still do, you still want to show that you are confident, right? So when you're answering your question, you want to answer them with all, you know, confidence. Be ready to show your inquisitiveness by asking questions. And this is very important, right? So in your first interview, your for your um, informal interview, your supervisor would definitely give you a chance. Oh, do you have any other? Do you have like questions that you want to ask me? And this is very important to not just say maybe no, I don't have a question. So you want to really prepare some questions to ask, and you don't just want to ask any uh, questions. And I I wrote here that I remember asking my supervisor if she expected that I begin to like write a proposal about a research right now, because I really didn't, as at, at that point, I didn't know how it's gonna work about the research or if she had some research in mind that we would be working on, right? And that brought a whole lot of discussions about, oh yes, there's something on ground and this is what it is and you can begin to look at this and that, right? So this kind of, you really want to show that you're inquisitive, you really want to show that you're intelligent, right? Then you want to ask questions about the type of guidance and support that will be provided. And like I said, this is key. Um, I use people say this a lot, and I think while it is not written in gold anywhere, I think it's true that the success of your graduate program probably depends on your supervisor. Am I right? Am I right, <laughs> Faida? Very correct, actually. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> you 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 want to really know the type of guidance and support that they will be providing. For instance, you might want to ask questions. Oh, I would. Um, uh, what kind of guidance do you provide to your graduates to your graduate students? Do you like meet them once a week? Do you, you know questions like that? Now let me, let me let me point this out. This may not necessarily be the questions. Um, you may not necessarily have to ask all of this question in your first meeting with them. It might be a um, you know subsequent um, question that you want to like ask and all of that. But remember, the whole idea of all of this is to just keep the relationship going with your prospective supervisor. And you can also ask if you you could speak with current students. So. While I had never really had this personally from any um, any any prospective supervisor when I was applying, I just find my way of reaching out to prospective um, sorry to current students of either the department or the lab, right, and to talk with them and you know to just have a glimpse of who the supervisor really is and you know your mode of working, and it helps you make informed decisions when you are at the crossroad of trying to make a decision between, do I go to University of Cornell or do I go to North um, Carolina State University? You really want to like have all of this information. I mean, make your research. So it's good to ask questions. Now uh, we're gonna be moving to see if to prepare for your formal interview. And again, I would like yeah. to reiterate, your formal mm -hmm. interview is a type of interview. Um, we are running out of time, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
your formal interview is a type of interview you have with your, um, your, your admission committee. So quickly, you want to remember the key points you wrote in your statement of purpose and what you have in your CV. You want to brush up on your basics in your course. So if you are saying you are in mechanical engineering and you are going for a mechanical engineering master's or PhD, you really want to know some basics like basics in your fluid mechanics, some, some basics generally that you know a first year, second year student should know. Right. So you also want to ensure that you have a strong internet connection for the interview. And this is very important. We understand how things could be where we want to have meetings like this, right? Technical issues and all of that. You don't want to have these technical issues, to be honest. You don't want to have your internet connection fluctuating when you have like three committee members waiting on you, right? You want to ensure that your space has good lighting. So you want to ensure that they are not seeing a shadow when they are talking with you. They are, I mean, they are seeing your face and you should also wear something comfortable and free. So you don't have to, this is not meeting with the president, right? You don't want to like have your tie and all of that. You will be surprised at what people wear when you come here, to be honest. But you just want to dress comfortable. Of course, you don't want to dress and look like, you know, some 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 like so informal right but you want to dress comfortable and free and you want to be confident so learn to take a deep breath it works a lot for me especially when you want to meet those people for the first time you want to be confident and um just quickly before we round up let's look at some sample questions so you ask tell us about yourself right i mean we get these questions a lot even in um applying to jobs in in industries right so now this is great this plan you have been asked tell us about yourself please you want to avoid to speak about your life journey you know we, we like this um from my childhood and when i was growing up kind of story <laughs> you don't want to, you really want to avoid that so you want to speak to your academic journey remember you have what you have in your your cv your sop you want to speak about your interests you like to learn new things this is who you are just be genuine about it like um alaba mentioned speak your truths right you really want to like speak your truth and have a compelling story around it. So you want to talk about your research experience if you have, and if you don't have, you have relevant work experience. You want to talk about it in simple and concise form to be not 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 an epistle. And you want to also talk about your skills. So you ask questions like why University of X Y Z. So you want to talk about why did you choose this university in the first place? Is it like it is rated? Is it that your program is rated? Is it that the um, engineering faculty what is like the best, you know, all of those things are the things that you really want to prepare and have at the back of the mind when you are like uh, preparing to answer this question, then how will you contribute to our program? And this is a bit tricky. I'm sorry, I don't have an example here, but thinking about it, how will you contribute to our program? And this again is where you want to reiterate your skills. You are coming for, for a master's program. What are you bringing to the table? What, what do you think you can do? Do you intend to like publish your work? Do you intend to like, you know, bring the new skills that you have, the things that you are used to? So these are the things that you want to like package together and put on the table. Now, what are your career goals? And this is where you want to talk about your goals. Do you intend to be in academia or you want to go into the industry after your program, but you want to be specific such that it makes sense that, oh, this person has a light of where they are going. Let us not forget that these things can change in terms of your career goals and all of that. Life, I mean, the only constant thing in life is change, but as at that moment and that time, you really want to be sure that this is what you want to do. Like I said, it's that it's your it's your truth now. It could change later. So lastly, um, you've actually had this meeting with your you may not be you may not be able to like follow up on your admission committee, right? So you're just waiting and hoping and trusting that they get back to you. But you could follow up on your um prospective supervisor so um you want to what what do you do while you wait what do you do why they tell you oh you could apply and i'm going to just like use my um my experience what i did um when i was trying to follow up with my supervisor so, she, so we already had this meeting and she had mentioned that oh um there is I, she's expecting some funding and we're hoping and you know really trusting that things are things are like going to work out. And what I did was to follow her on LinkedIn. So as soon as they, she publishes some 
um, she posts some publications. I go read about them and make comments like, oh, oh, this is so insightful. And I have this question and all of that, right? And you could also send them a mail and um, you could, you could, you could, you could send a mail asking questions about some of their papers and some, some, some academic related and uh, questions that you have, right? And lastly, one thing that I that came differently to me was that I remember, and this is really tied to ISI, right? So I remember in December, and I wanted to December that um, I think 2021, and I wanted to like apply to the University of Toronto, and. I knew that high scholar was going to be paying my application fee, but then I needed to package it in front of my, um, to, to not package it, but to let her know that I am also, you know, trying to like make her for to get scholarship for. So I just sent her a message, dear professor, this is this, this, I'm delighted to tell you that my application fee to the University of Toronto is going to be sponsored by scholarship and all of that. So it was just a form of package and, and it shows that, oh, this person is actually, you know, working at, at, at this, right? So that was that was really helpful. And like I said, in, in summary, you want to follow up. You don't want to bug them. Or you just want to follow up reasonably and intelligently, right? You want to follow up on their um, publications and do all of these things. If they have a LinkedIn um, account or, uh, or Twitter, you want to follow, you want to follow up, uh, like follow them, right? I mean, it's good, right? So, but in all, we can only hope for the best. All of this in all may not necessarily guarantee that you're going to be admitted, but it just helps to be able to know that you have done all you need you you need to do on your part and like i said we can only hope for the best and hopefully we're going to be hearing some very exciting and good news from you all in the nearest future um thank you for listening that was powerful Tosin. oh my god thank you and thank you for speaking through your experience i mean that's what makes it even more beautiful when we see people that have passed through this and know that we can also like, you know, go down this path and be successful at the end. But, um, I hand it over to the president. So, Ochoko. so now we can take questions. I know we've been responding to most of the questions in the chat. And I also want to say we can um, allow participants to unmute but you need to make sure that you're not somewhere that um, there's a lot of background noise. Uh, if you'd like to unmute, just raise your hand and if you want to ask a question and all. And then we would wrap up in the next um, 10 minutes. Okay, I see three hands. Uh, it would be good for you to, so whenever you log in on Zoom or all these platforms, it would be good for you to change the name from the name of your device to your first and last name so that, you know, people can be able to refer to you. So I'm not sure that I know Techno, LCA, Techno Common, I'm not sure, but uh, Kenichi, um, you can unmute. Okay. Um. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the lecture. It was um, quite informative. Um, I have a couple of questions as regards um getting um potential um advisors when applying for graduate schools. Number one is um to the last speaker. What is the most effective way to streamline the thousands of schools in the U.S. For instance, to arrive at a given number, which offer your choice graduate course or have faculties with similar research interests, we all know that this process can be quite overwhelming. So do you have any recommendation or advice on how to streamline the thousands of schools in order to get um, a reasonable number that you can that have your choice course or your that have your research interest? Um, okay, thank you. So I'm going to quickly speak to that. And um, I remember that when I began the process, text, I would always refer to high scholar. Thank you, high scholar. I remember I had attended the seminar and one of the tools that they mentioned was, you know, I think there is this US news 
um, websites where you can search for universities in the US that has your courses. So you can like type by like search by your course. So there's US schools and I think there is Times Education as well. Um, please correct me if I'm right or wrong for the US. So you can search by your course. And of course, to be honest, I, I had a number of schools that had my course. But of course, remember that you can't fit into all of these schools. So while you're simultaneously preparing for your GRE, you're simultaneously like trying to complete your academic and you're looking at your CGPA, you could just start by looking at each of these schools and see what they require. And that is where I think you start from. You want to look at their requirements. So if um, they are telling me that I have to have a CGP of this and I don't meet up, then I know that it's out of my list. If I have, if probably you've done your GRE or your TOEFL and they're telling me I have to have a, um, um, a GRE max score of this and I mean point score of this and um, um, verbal school of this and I know I don't meet up, that is out of my list. I mean, it was literally uh, like trying to just eliminate as much as I can and if I really know that, oh, I think I, I can't eliminate this, another step I do um, that I think is also helpful is to write the program coordinator. So, and in your mail, you want to ask them, so this is who you are, this is your profile, do, you, do, they, do they think that you need um, to have a supervisor, do they think that this is okay for you to do? So, luckily, most of those people can, they, they, they respond to you, so you also want to like, be able to, for instance, I will cite an example. I tried writing to University of Buffalo at that time, and they were telling me that the the the, the program coordinator literally told me to go and write rewrite my GRE, and I'm like, because I didn't have a point score of one sixty, and I'm like, wait, this is out of my list. I can't do that again, right? I mean, that was for me. So those are like the way I was able to like streamline the list of schools that I that I went for. Then again, I reached out to my colleagues that are already in the US. For instance, some of the schools I applied to, I had colleagues there. So that way I was able to like, you know, streamline. I know this is, this this list is, is it, I mean, this school is top on my list. This school is next on my list. And then we come to like research interest. So you, you go to mechanical engineering in this school and you literally can't find any research that relates to something that you feel that you can be you can you can do comfortably for the next two three years of your life and that's that's a red flag to be honest you don't just want to force yourself in so you might just want to also streamline that way i don't know if any other person have like other ways you can streamline the schools you intend to like apply to i think that's a very comprehensive answer um are you there? Yes. Yes. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I don't have any question. I'm just waiting for maybe a question. Does anyone have a question? Okay. Uh, I can see Techno LC8. I'm not sure who that is, but you should be able to unmute yourself. Please tell us your name. Okay, good evening, I'm Precious Purple. Nice to meet you, Precious. Okay, I want to sincerely thank you for this opportunity you're giving to us to enlighten us on graduate school. I think I, I, I saw this advert just yesterday and I missed yesterday and I said I was going to attend today's meeting. My question is simple. Um, I was the one that commented earlier I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm working on an application currently in a school in Romania, a scholarship, a Transvenia Academic Scholarship. And my CV, as I speak to you, I'm done preparing my CV and it's up to five pages. And it's caring, hearing you saying at least the CV should be streamlined to two pages. So I don't know. I don't know what to remove. I don't know what to do at this point. Oh, okay, does anyone want to take that? Uh, first of all, my question to you is, did you use effects, templates, and the likes on the CV? 
No, 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 no. It's just normal. I'm not using any 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 template. It's just I, I just I'm just doing it in Word right now and nothing. No, no template. I was supposed to use EO Pass, but I left it since it was not composing. Um, okay. Alaba? Yeah, sorry, I didn't get the question. So he said is he has a CV that is currently five pages and uh -huh. he's very shocked to hear us say that the CV should just be within two pages. Yes, uh, I'm sure if you look at that CV, there will be so many things you can take out. What would you say constituted the bulk part of the CV? Maybe too many details on each bullet point. Those details okay. can be your statement of purpose. Like you could, you know, talk about them in your statement of purpose as it relates to the graduate school. But maybe you have too many bullet points on that one heading. Or where would you say the bulk of the... Um, even professionals have one page um, <laughs> CV, so you have to find a way to reduce okay. it. If okay. you know, yeah, find a way basically. If you have teaching, maybe you have teaching experiences that are very similar, you taught physics in this place and taught physics again in another place, maybe you can find a way to put them together. But it, I would recommend it not exceeding two pages at all. Yeah. Okay. And okay. then if possibly you have some experiences that are dating as far back as 2011 or yeah. 2010 or something, you might, if it's not really, 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 really important to what you're applying for, you might consider yeah. removing those type of things. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And another okay. thing I would like to also add is the fact that it's your first, I don't know, but I feel that it might be your first draft. And it's okay that you want to put everything in your mind and, you know, in your head on the paper, right? Yeah. But then you yeah. don't want to be too attached to this CV that you are so close to it and you don't, you are feeling that, oh, everything is important, <laughs> right? So what you yeah. need to do is just like um, Faida and Alaba had mentioned, you want to sit down again. If I take a fresh look at it and remove as much as possible and put only the relevant stuff. So it's okay that you can even have like up to three drafts and in your final draft, you'll be proud of what you have reduced it to. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so um, we are running out of time. This is from here, this is 9.30 in the area. Oh. So let uh, we can I just take one more question and then we'll just end the session. Uh, so one more question. I can see some ends. Uh, Kineshi, you still have Te more questions? Techno Kamon, I think has been raising his lower hand. Techno Kamon, mm -hmm. hey, please unmute yourself. Um, and okay. You can unmute. If Techno Kamon here doesn't want to unmute, then Kenechi. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Tosi. I have a second question to ask about um, when is the best time of the year to reach out to potential advisors and what factors should be considered? Perhaps, um, I don't know. Maybe there's a particular time you're not supposed to reach out to them. Maybe they'll be in the field or something. What having experience over there and uh, what factors you think should be considered and what time of the year do you think is best to reach out to potential advisors? And also after that, I have my last question. During application phase, do you have any trick or advice on how to you know get application fee waivers basically for like say persons that uh, wish to apply for safety reasons up to 15 schools, you're not expected to pay you know, schools. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. So from your last, I'll start from your last question. I don't think I'm like the right person to ask because unfortunately I didn't get any application fee waiver, but then I only applied to four or five schools yes so maybe um, others can speak to that i try to you know apply but i guess my compelling story of the reasons why i wanted to apply for applications fee waiver was not so compelling but of course i know that people get application fee waiver but others could speak to that and about the time of the year to begin sending your 
I mean, writing code emails. I think it depends. It depends on either you're trying to like um, come in in fall or come in in spring or winter as we have here. So, so if it is fall, that is you're trying to resume in September. Yeah. While I don't think it's a rule of thumb, I know that some people start reaching out to prospective supervisor as early as, as um, you remember, it is like fall, fall, like if you're coming in fall 2023, we're in April right now, and fall is September 2023. So some people start to like reach out to their um, supervisor like in May, June, July, you know, for me, uh, did I say May, June, July? Sorry. That is like August the previous year. So if I'm coming in in fall 2023, I'm like expected to have been reaching out to supervisors like August 2022. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah, right. So for, for, my, for the supervisors I reached out to, they were basically like in September the previous year. So I had interviews in November that year then i was giving go ahead or go and apply like in december january so you you're expected to have like start reaching out to supervisor like the previous year say um may june july august maybe august the previous year downward august september november you know like that just like keep reaching out to as many as you can and be strategic about it as well. So that is that. And another tip that I would say, you don't just want to send your emails to supervisor any time of the day. You want to really account for the time difference. Yeah, so I, mo I, I, most, of, most of what I, most of the things I know people do, for instance, for me, I might have like written three emails in a weekend, like on a weekend rather, and I would schedule them to send 3 p.m. Nigerian time because I knew we are like, um, six hours different. So it get delivers to them like 9 a.m. <laughs> in their own time. So it's like one of the messages that will come up when they open their like emails. So that was one thing I know, I like I knew I did. So I, you don't want to send them on weekends. You don't want to send them like late at night here such that your messages are now coming like, like entering into their mailbox in the afternoon. To noon. So I like to like target the morning time so that they can at least, you know, see them. And of course, during the week, I personally don't like to send meals on Fridays. So, yeah. Okay. Um, another one. I Sorry, this, uh, this is my last <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and um, we'll try to keep the response as short as possible. Okay. Please, um, continue. Uh, we cannot hear you. I hear me now. Hello. Can you hear me now? Do the same. But we can look with it. Okay. Uh, do you want to just type it in the chat or something? We cannot hear you. How about okay, now? Um, I hear me now. Before, 